If you've ever worked on game or software development, especially using Unity, you probably know the frustration of handling builds and deployments. While creating the game itself is exciting, the process of building, testing, and deploying can quickly turn into a repetitive, time-consuming grind. Let me give you an example. Imagine you're developing a game and you've just added a new feature. Now, you want to release it on multiple platforms, like PC and Android. Normally, you'd have to switch between platforms in Unity, wait for it to re-import assets and adjust settings, build the game, and then test it to make sure everything works. If something doesn't work, you have to fix the issue, go back, switch platforms again and wait for the whole process to repeat. This manual process is not only time-consuming but also frustrating. Every time you make a small change, you need to go through the same cycle of switching platforms, waiting for Unity to build and testing the game. And while Unity is building, you can't even continue coding or making other improvements because the editor is busy. This is where continuous integration and continuous deployment comes in. With CI and CD, you can automate this entire process. Instead of manually switching platforms and running builds, a CI CD pipeline can automatically detect changes in your code, build the game for multiple platforms, and run tests for you. For example, after you push the new feature to your code repository, the CI and CD system kicks in. It will automatically compile the game for both PC and Android, run tests to check if everything works, and even deploy the game if the build succeeds. This means you don't have to sit around waiting for Unity to finish building. You can focus on writing better code, while the CI and CD pipeline takes care of the repetitive tasks. In short, CI and CD saves you a ton of time and reduces the risk of human error by automating the build, test, and deployment process. You can keep working on your project and the pipeline will ensure your game is continuously being tested and built behind the scenes. Now, when it comes to implementing CI CD in Unity, you've got quite a few options. There's Jenkins, GitHub Actions, Unity DevOps, and a bunch of others. Unity DevOps is probably the easiest to use, especially if you're just starting out. But here's the thing, we're not going to use it. Why? Unity DevOps is great, but it's limited to Unity projects. Instead, we're going to dive into GitHub Actions. Now, I know what you might be thinking, isn't that more complicated? But trust me, it's not as hard as it sounds, and I'll walk you through everything step by step. The real beauty of using GitHub Actions is its versatility. Once you've got the hang of it, you can apply this knowledge to all sorts of projects, building websites, other software development tasks, even full-on DevOps work. It's a skill that'll serve you well beyond just game development. Let's roll up our sleeves and get started. All right, before we dive deeper, let's make sure we're all on the same page. It's crucial that you have at least a basic understanding of Git and GitHub. These tools are fundamental to what we're about to do. Don't worry if you're not familiar with these terms, I've got you covered. In the description below, you'll find a link to a complete guide I've put together. It's a playlist that walks you through everything you need to know about Git and GitHub from scratch. To get started with GitHub Actions, we first need to understand the main parts or building blocks that make it work. There are three key components you should be familiar with, workflows, jobs, and steps. Think of a workflow as a set of automated tasks that you attach to a GitHub repository. You can have one or many workflows for each repository. A workflow is basically the overall process you want to automate using GitHub Actions. Inside a workflow, you'll have one or more jobs. Jobs are smaller pieces of work that break down the process into more manageable parts. A workflow can have multiple jobs, and they can run either at the same time in parallel or one after the other in sequence. Jobs, in turn, consist of steps. These steps define the exact tasks to be done, and they are executed one by one in order. For example, one step might download the code, the next one installs the dependencies, and the last one runs the tests. Imagine you have a project hosted on GitHub, and you want to automate certain tasks like running tests every time new code is pushed to it. Here's how the building blocks come together. You create a workflow in your repository to handle the automation. Inside this workflow, you define jobs that describe the major tasks, such as testing the code or deploying it somewhere. Within each job, you add steps to break it down further, like downloading the code, installing the necessary libraries, and running tests. These workflows don't just run all the time, you'll set up triggers to decide when they should kick in. For instance, a workflow could run every time you push new code, or only when you manually start it. I've created a simple Unity project that allows you to increment, decrement, or reset a text value. It's pretty basic, nothing too fancy. After creating this project, I pushed it to a GitHub repository. 
If you look at my GitHub repository, you'll notice that it contains folders like assets, project settings, and packages. Now, as I explained in my Git and GitHub course, we don't actually need to track all of these folders in our version control system. Now, let's move on to creating our first workflow. To do this, you'll want to go to the Actions tab in your GitHub repository. Once you're on the Actions page, look for an option that says Set up a workflow yourself and click on it. This will allow us to create a custom workflow for our project. Now, let's give our workflow file a name. This is the first thing we need to do. I'm going to call it First Action. It's important to note where this file will be stored. If you look at the path, you'll see that it's located in a .github folder within your repository, then in a workflow subfolder. And finally, as a YAML file. The YML extension stands for YAML, which is simply a text formatting language. This location is crucial because it's where GitHub looks for action workflows. They must be stored in a .github folder inside a workflow subfolder and as a YAML file. Now, we can write it from scratch together. This way, we'll fully understand how to configure and create a workflow. We start by giving our workflow a name. In the YAML file, we do this by adding a name key in the first line, followed by a colon. The key must be name. This is a reserved keyword. After the colon, we specify our workflow name. I'm going to call it first workflow. Remember, you can have multiple workflows by adding different YAML files in the workflows folder. This name is specific to this particular workflow. After naming the workflow, we need to define when it should be executed. We do this with the on key, like name, on is a reserved keyword that GitHub Actions looks for. After on, we define the event or events that should trigger this workflow to run. For now, we'll just add one event by writing workflow dispatch. This is a special event that allows us to manually trigger the workflow. However, there are many other events we can use to automatically trigger workflows, which we'll explore later. For example, we could add events like push or pull request. The push event would trigger the workflow every time code is pushed to the repository, while pull request would trigger it when a pull request is triggered. So now we have a name and a trigger. What's missing is the actual work that needs to be done. We define this using the jobs key, it's important to use jobs plural, not job. The jobs key doesn't take a value immediately. Instead, we move to a new line and indent because YAML uses indentation to show hierarchy. Under jobs, we define our first job and give it a name. I'll call it first job, but you can name it whatever you like. This job definition also doesn't take a direct value. We indent again and add some details about the job. First, we need to define the runner, the environment where the job will execute its steps. We do this with the runs on key. For the runner, we can choose from various environments provided by GitHub Actions. I'm going to use Ubuntu Latest, which will use the latest version of Ubuntu. Finally, we define the steps of our job using the steps key. Under steps, we list out each step starting with a dash. Each step can have a name and a command to run. For our first step, I'll name it print greeting and use the run key to define a command that will echo hello world to the console. The command we're using is echo hello world. If you're not familiar with Echo, don't worry. It's a basic command used in Linux systems, including Ubuntu, which is the operating system we specified earlier with Ubuntu Latest. Echo is simply a way to display text in the console. This is the basic structure of a GitHub Actions workflow. Now that we've defined our job, we can commit it to the repository. This is important because GitHub Action workflows are part of your code. They're defined in files within your Git repository, not as something external. After committing, let's go back to the Actions tab. You'll notice the layout has changed. We now see an overview of past workflow runs, which will populate as we run workflows over time. We can still add new workflows, but we also see a list of all workflows GitHub has identified in our repository. GitHub finds these workflows by looking in the .github workflows folder and reading the YAML files there. We can see our first workflow listed, and GitHub has identified that it has a workflow dispatch trigger. This means we can manually trigger it by clicking the Run Workflow button. When we click this button, the workflow will run against the main branch. Once it starts running, we can see its progress in the Actions tab. A yellow dot indicates it's currently running, and a green checkmark shows it completed successfully. We can click on the workflow run for more details. Here, we see the job that was executed as part of this workflow. Clicking on the job reveals even more information, including the steps we defined and some automatic steps added by GitHub, like setup and cleanup. We can expand these steps to see more details. For example, in the setup step, we can see how the runner system is prepared. 
In our custom steps, we can see the commands that were executed and their results. This is how we define, execute, and evaluate our first workflow. We can run this workflow as many times as we want by going back to the workflow and clicking the Run Workflow button again. Now that we have a solid understanding of GitHub workflows, I have some exciting news. You don't always have to write these workflows manually. There's a fantastic website called GameCI that we can use. GameCI is an open source project created by the community specifically for game developers. It's designed to automate continuous integration and continuous deployment workflows in game development, which can save us a lot of time and effort. Let's try using GameCI now. First, we're going to create a new workflow in our GitHub repository. We'll name this new workflow build. Next, we need to visit the GameCI website. There's a link to the documentation in the description of this video. If you go to the documentation and look under the build section, you'll find a pre-made workflow at the bottom of the page. Go ahead and copy this workflow. Now let's paste it into our new build workflow file in GitHub. This workflow is specifically designed for Unity projects, so it's perfect for what we're doing. Let's take a closer look at what this workflow does. In this workflow, we have a name for the workflow and a trigger that specifies when it should run. There are also some new terms to understand, such as the strategy section under the jobs. Within the strategy, there are two important settings, fail fast and matrix. In the matrix section, we define the different platforms that we want to build for. The matrix allows us to run builds for multiple platforms like web, Android, Mac OS, etc. in parallel. The fail fast setting controls what happens if one of the builds fails. However, we've set fail fast to false, which means that even if one of the builds fails, like the web build, the other builds like Android or Mac OS will continue running. This ensures that all jobs complete even if one encounters an issue. Next, in the step section of the workflow, we use keywords like uses. These keywords refer to pre-built steps that are already available for us to use. For example, when we created our first workflow, we used a simple Linux command echo hello world to print text on the screen. Similarly, there are pre-built actions made by the community that we can use in our workflows. One common step you'll see is actions checkout at v4. This step clones our repository into the environment where the jobs are running. In this case, since we're running the workflow on an Ubuntu machine, it will clone the repository onto that Ubuntu instance. If you want to learn more about the checkout command, you can visit the GitHub Actions Marketplace, where you can find verified and trusted actions provided by GitHub and the community. Additionally, you'll notice some keywords like Unity license or email. This is necessary because Unity requires a valid license to verify its users. So, as part of the setup, we need to provide our Unity license information. Now, let's go ahead and set up our license. First, you'll need to open Unity Hub and log in with your Unity account. This is crucial because we want to make sure we're activating the correct license, so double check that you're using the right account. Once you're logged in, now just go to the Unity Hub menu, click on Preferences, then Licenses, and finally click on Add. From there, you can choose get a free personal license. Now, here's the important part. We need to find a file called ULF. This file contains your Unity license information. Where you'll find this file depends on your operating system. If you're using Windows, look in C Program Data Unity for Mac users. It's in Library Application Support Unity. And if you're on Linux, check .local share Unity 3 Unity. If you're having trouble finding the file, make sure you've completed both steps. Logging into Unity Hub, and activating your license, the file won't be there until you've done both. One last thing to keep in mind, these folders might be hidden by default on your system. You might need to change your folder settings to show hidden files and folders. Now, save your build YAML file in GitHub and commit the changes. Next, go to settings, then navigate to secrets and variables, actions. Here, you'll need to create three new secrets, Unity license, Unity email, and Unity password. Make sure these names are exactly the same as what you see on the screen, as we are using them in our workflow. These secrets are encrypted and secure, so there's no need to worry about exposing sensitive information. For Unity license, copy and paste the content of the Unity license file we created earlier and save it. Similarly, for Unity email and Unity password, enter the appropriate details and save them. Once you've added all three, you'll have three secure keys available. First, we need to update our workflow file to build for both Windows and WebGL. I'm adjusting the build configuration to target these two platforms specifically. This setup ensures that every time we push changes to our Git repository, the system automatically triggers builds for both Windows and WebGL in the cloud. Next, 
Let's test the workflow by making some changes in the project and pushing them to GitHub. Once you do that, you'll notice that the builds start running in parallel. Keep in mind that the first build may take a bit longer, so be patient. When the builds are finished, you'll find the build artifacts for both platforms in the artifact section. You can download them from there to test each build. This automated process makes our development workflow much more efficient. Now, every time we push new code, fresh builds for both Windows and WebGL will be created automatically, no manual intervention needed. Additionally, any updates to player settings like screen resolution will be reflected in the builds. And that's all for today's tutorial. I hope this helps you in your development journey. See you in the next one.